Simon, thank you very much, not just for a very generous uh, introduction, uh, but thank you, thank you Ireland, thank you Cork, for convening this extraordinarily timely, uh, important conference. And thank you personally uh, for your leadership as Tanushta and the way in which you and others have made an effort to elevate ocean issues truly with the focus and the urgency that they deserve. Uh, harnessing our ocean wealth, uh, your government's integrated plan for Ireland's marine sector is, uh, it's not just a roadmap to double the value of the marine's economy contribution to GDP by 2030, and that brings its own set of challenges as you can imagine, as you've listened to the comments from the earlier panel. But it is, most importantly, a path uh, to protect the oceans for the next generation and generations beyond that. Why do you think Alicia's comments met with the reaction that they met? When I was at the United Nations and privileged to sign the Paris Accords for the United States and privileged to negotiate them for the United States or lead the negotiating team, uh, I happened to be holding my granddaughter. My, my daughter had showed up with her and she disappeared for a moment, so I was holding the granddaughter. And uh, all of a sudden they called the United States and I didn't know what to do, so I just walked out with my granddaughter in my arms. And uh, the place exploded in applause uh, for her, <laughs> for the future generations. That's what Alicia uh, and her statement and Greta's statements and others like it carry with it today. Uh, they're telling the truth. They are the future, and we are not getting the job done for the future. So we have to be honest with ourselves, and we have to recognize the degree to which the last years have been wrapped up with words. Alicia said she's frustrated. I'm angry, and she's angry too, but probably more frustrated. I'm probably more angry because I did not get into public life not to deliver. I didn't get into public life in order to fail. And I certainly didn't get into public life to avoid the truth. But today, we have public leaders who not only avoid the truth, they try to alter the truth. Thousands of lies from the highest voices, supposedly, in our politics. This has to change. I got involved in this issue when I uh, was Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts and we faced the challenge of acid rain. And I was privileged as a Lieutenant Governor to lead a governor's panel on that subject, working with John Sununu of New Hampshire, working with Dick Celeste of Ohio, and we took a conservative, market-based idea called cap and trade. And we used it in order to deal with sulfur and deal with acid rain. You don't hear about acid rain today, folks. Why? Because we addressed the problem. And we used a market-based solution in order to try to deal with it. So this can all be done. I'm convinced of that, Alicia knows that, you know that. But the fact is, as we sit here, stand here, talk here today, not one nation in the world is living sustainably. And we, collectively, are not getting the job done. When we first listened to Jim Hansen testify to us in 1988, and tell us it's happening now, here it is, this is climate change, here are the dangers. Then, 
adaptation and mitigation were options for the future. Now they are a must, and they are inadequate to the task. So you look around this room, and from UN Special Envoy Peter Thompson, who's working his heart out in order to try to get people to do what they know they have to do, to, to Merid McGuinness, the Vice President of the European Parliament, and to dozens of ministers who are here, and particularly to those most threatened by actions that they didn't take, but by developed nations who seem to act still with indifference to the reality of what's going to happen to them, to all of those small island ministers who are here who are facing the challenge of a lifetime. Yes, management of the oceans is a stewardship of a $500 billion business, $500 billion of global economy and the livelihoods of 12% of the world's population. But the truth is that uh, we are far from doing what we know we should be doing and what we can be doing. Uh, Ireland particularly understands this. Ireland has always had to fight against a disadvantage. There's a nature in our politics in Boston with the Irish uh, who have played such an extraordinary role of just being fighters and understanding how to get the job done. And, and Ireland has this enormous uh, biodiversity and deep water coral reef and on the other, and, 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 and uh, let me just simplify it by saying, I think Ireland knows too well the scale of the challenge uh, with just 2% of its waters currently protected, uh, but we are all deeply impressed by the fact that there is a commitment and a conviction which you can feel from Simon and you feel from this conference and this weekend, uh, and even expressed by the Senate here, that, that half of Ireland's uh, half of Ireland's seas and ocean are going to be set aside as a marine protected area. But it cannot be emphasized enough as we gather here, folks. And I want to emphasize this. I'm an optimist in this. I believe we can do this. My frustration and my anger comes from the fact that we're not doing the things that we know we can do. But the fact is, time is not a friend to any of us on this issue right now. Not unless we change the decisions we're making. And the challenge is not just about the environment. It's about fundamental policy choices in a world that is rapidly changing around us. Everything is changing. The way we communicate, the way we do business. By the way, I thought Declan McDonald's description of the responsibility of business could not be more on target. And I hope we will all work and find new ways to infiltrate a greater portion of the corporate sector of the world to understand its responsibilities of corporate citizenship. Declan clearly does and articulated them here today and I thought it was an important contribution. But the fact is that this is about fundamental values, fundamental policy choices, choices that I think most of us sort of took for granted as we grew up. This is the way we want to live, clean, for the future, protecting the future. It's about the next generation. It's always supposed to be about the next generation. Being able to count on the oceans that we are now taking much too much for granted on a global basis, and we have now pushed oceans, even oceans, vast, amazing expanse of ocean being pushed to the brink. So we're here together because we're in a fight. You understand it. That's what's brought you here. We're part of a movement that has been growing over the last five years with billions in commitments and 3.8 million square miles of newly protected ocean. And we all have our eyes on Norway and the meeting coming up uh, this fall in October. 
and the next Star Oceans Gathering, and then the UN. But every time we're together, my friends, we have to remind ourselves that these gatherings cannot simply be an excuse to talk. They've got to become an exhortation to action, and indeed, they've got to become the action itself that is going to pull us back from the brink. We have no right to rest on the laurels of the last meetings or the last commitments, particularly since we know that those commitments are not getting the job done. We have no right to do that, particularly when not anywhere over the globe we, do we see uh, not see too much money chasing too few fish. That's really what it is about. How many restaurants open that are now going to now offer more fish? How fast does that demand have to be met? How many people sit down and open up a menu and check to see whether the fish were caught sustainably? How many restaurateurs actually make that? How many people have enforced and endorsed and actually are implementing the port state measures, which is supposed to make certain that we guarantee where the fish comes from? We can't rest on our laurels, not when on the high seas there is still too little enforcement. Vast areas of the ocean where there's no enforcement of all because there's no jurisdiction at all. And we don't even see the world coming together to create that jurisdiction and to uphold the law. Ian Urbina of the New York Times has written an extraordinary series about a young Cambodian who went to Thailand in order to pursue construction, to have an alternative in life. But he was made a captive crewman with a chain around his neck for two years, being forced to fish and fish illegally. And that fish found its way to a port and it found its way to a stomach. We can't rest on laurels when there's still more than 400 unresolved maritime boundary disputes in the world, which leave behind ungoverned ocean spaces, which are ripe today with illicit transshipment, with human trafficking, with drug smuggling, with arms trafficking, and no enforcement, especially on the overfishing. We still see some people, notwithstanding our efforts to ban drift net fishing, where you have thousands of miles of monofilament net that goes behind a ship, strip mines the ocean, two-thirds of the catch can be thrown overboard, not used, but it's not sellable. And we now have outlaw fishing people who go out and still use monofilament nets. What happens is some of them break off. They become ghost fishing nets. They fish, the weight of the fish trapped takes them down the bottom, the, the, the scavengers scavenge, and they rise again and fish again. No enforcement. We can't rest on laurels when a garbage patch twice the size of Texas floats in the Pacific and rising carbon dioxide from emissions still increases ocean acidity and devastates coral reefs and marine life, changing the ecosystem itself. We can't rest on laurels when nearly 60% of global fish stocks are fished at their maximum levels and 33% are overfished and already in need of recovery. We can't rest on laurels when the World Bank tells us that poor fishery management costs countries $83 billion a year in lost revenue. Now, I know that all of you have come here because you are committed to this journey. But there are two stark realities that we need to start imprinting into every consideration that we have regarding the steps we must take going forward. First, there is no blue economy, there is no fishing industry if we don't protect our oceans. Pretty simple proposition. And we can't protect our oceans if we can't show people everywhere that done right, protecting oceans doesn't actually hurt jobs, which is the argument. It is jobs. And second, you can't protect the oceans without solving the problem of climate change, and you can't solve the problem of climate change without protecting the oceans. They go hand in hand. 
51% of the oxygen we breathe as human beings on this planet comes from the ocean. But as Peter Thompson pointed out earlier today, more and more of that oxygen is deprived and diminished by virtue of the loss of the kelp that Alicia mentioned or by virtue of the acidification that is changing the chemistry of the ocean. Folks, we are changing the chemistry of the ocean faster than it has ever been changed in the last 50 million years. And we know that because there are certain people that most of us respect who can tell us those things. They're called scientists. And most people in public life have earned at least enough education to respect basic science. Obviously, not everybody. <laughs> there are now more than 500 dead zones around the world. We have a huge dead zone outside the Mississippi River. When I ran for President of the United States, I've dealt with this in, the, in states like Minnesota and Iowa and uh, all the farm states, same problems people have here, because we have nitrate overload because of pesticides and the chemistry of farming. And so it, it literally spills off into the Missouri River, down in the Mississippi River, out into the Gulf of Mexico, and nothing lives in those dead zones. Nothing can live because there's no oxygen. So the damage has now reached such an extreme level that unless we change our practices by the middle of the century, there's going to be more plastic, more dead zones, more plastic in the oceans than fish, and more dead zones, which will contribute to the changing of the ecosystem itself. My friends, we know the enemy, and the enemy is man-made. That's the downside. But it also brings with it an upside, a huge upside. If it's man-made, it can be man-solved. And when I say man, generic. It's like guys nowadays, men and women, gender nonspecific. Uh, we have the capacity to provide the solution. That's what really is so utterly frustrating here. You know what the solution is to climate change? Energy policy. It's not something we don't have within our grasp. When we negotiated the Paris Agreement, we created Mission Innovation. Mission Innovation was, it came with Prime Minister Modi's strong imprint, with President Xi's accession. It is an effort by the major industrial countries and the ones with the greatest technology to put their foot to the fire and begin to develop any technology that might be able to add to our ability to deal with this problem. But energy policy is the solution to climate change. We all know what we have to do. We have to move as rapidly as possible to electrify the creation of power and to make sure that that electrification is coming not from fossil fuel. We have a time frame that we understand. We have to be able to reach a low carbon, no net carbon economy by 2050. And we're simply not on track to be able to do those things, even though we know what we have to do. We have to begin, we, we should not be moving in the opposite direction with respect to tailpipe standards for automobiles. We should be moving higher. And we have the technological capacity to do that. And if you do that, you will reduce the other things that you might have to do in order to deal with climate change. We need to change industries, provision of power. We need to change the way we build buildings. We need to change some of the materials we use in it. We need to deal with big industry and concrete and the, the amazing energy demand that comes from that. And, and frankly, folks, we have to put things on the table that some of us for years resisted, whether or not fourth generation or next generation modular small nuclear power might be safer than China bringing 250 megawatts of coal-fired power online in the next 10 years, undoing almost everything some nations are trying to do. It doesn't make sense. There's an insanity in the way governments are behaving in various parts of the world and some businesses. And Alicia and Greta and a bunch of people understand that. 
They see it clearly, as you should too. So we need to make these decisions. The IPCC scientists have told us that over the course of the next 10 years, this was uh, 12 years, this was about two years ago now, coming into 2020, it'll be 10 years next year, a good measuring stick. We have those 10 years in which to hold the next 0.5 degrees from happening in terms of the Earth's warming, taking us from the one degree we are today up to the 1.5, and then let alone the two. Well, I worked as hard as anybody to try to make Paris happen. I went to China and negotiated with President Xi six weeks into being Secretary of State. Why? Because I knew if we didn't get China on board, we would have a repeat of what happened in Copenhagen and we wouldn't succeed in doing what we needed to do. So China worked with us and we said, let's take the next year and see if we can find a way to cooperate so that we're not at loggerheads the way we were in Copenhagen. And indeed, China did that. Why? Because their people were complaining about the quality of the water and the quality of their air. And so Beijing responded. One year later, President Obama and President Xi were able to stand up in front of the world and say, these are going to be our intended emission reductions. And that unleashed the dam and everybody followed, Europe and the rest of the world. And we went to Paris and we got that done. But I've got news for you folks. As important as Paris was, and is, Paris doesn't get the job done either. And we knew that. We weren't betting, we weren't pretending that we were going to tell the world we're leaving Paris with a guarantee that we're going to hold the Earth's temperature increase to 2 degrees centigrade. We didn't leave Paris with that promise. What we said, and I remember saying this specifically to the plenary session, after the gavel had been wrapped and we had joyously and appropriately celebrated all these countries committing to move in the same direction. What I said was the importance of Paris is not that we're going to guarantee the two degrees. The importance of Paris is we're sending a signal to the marketplace globally that 196 countries are all going to move simultaneously in the same direction. And that is going to unleash capital allocation that is going to create new technologies and rush us in the right direction. Well, guess what? It did exactly that for the first year and a half, two years. $358 billion was invested in alternative renewable sustainable energy the next year. The greatest amount ever allocated to that sector and for the first time in human history, more than for fossil fuel. So what happened? Solar is now absolutely cheaper than coal. And yet in certain countries, we can't convince them of that still. Partly because of the, of the, of, of, uh, the coal industry just standing up and spending money and resisting uh, dealing with this reality. So here we are living in a world with new platforms for the flow of information, living in a world in which everything is moving faster, goods are moving faster, People are moving faster, ideas are moving faster, lies are moving faster and farther around the world than ever before. The one thing that's not moving faster almost anywhere in the world is government. Government is not moving fast enough. And in the end, it is not going to be government that's going to save us from this. It is going to be mission innovation and the next discovery of battery storage or hydrogen as a fuel or fusion maybe finally comes home. I don't know, but I know this. When we put our minds to it, we know how to make it happen. And we haven't put our minds to it in that way. We don't have the kind of global collaboration that we should be having in the sharing and working on this technology. We don't have a vision being applied to how nations can come together to make this happen. So my friends, not only do we have to speed up the targets, that currently, if every nation in the world did what it promised to do in Paris, and they're not, but if every nation in the world did what they promised to do in Paris, we would still be at 3.7 degrees at the end of this century. And you know what a catastrophe that is. That's why Alicia is pleading with us to do something.
So I believe we can make this happen. I believe that we are demonstrating a capacity in certain ways right now. Uh, we, we, we are uh, uh, showing that we can create great parks in the sea and protected marine environments that rival the Grand Canyon, the Torres del Paine, the Serengeti. We're doing that. Since the first Our Ocean Conference in 2014, the world has protected 12.4 million acres, but hardly enough. President Remengen Sao of Palau spearheaded the designation of Palau Sanctuary, making 80% of Palau's waters no-take areas. You heard that from Ambassador Ludong. And they're going to host the next Our Ocean Conference. Uh, but it's still, they don't have the capacity to enforce all of that area. You know it and we know it. When I was secretary, I, brought to, I had the privilege of being able to bring together the admirals and the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And I sat there and I said, you know, I remember transiting the Pacific Ocean on a ship when I was going to Vietnam. And we had plenty of at-sea days in the high seas where we could have transited specific fishing areas. Why don't we do that? Why don't we involve these, these, the navies of the world and the satellites of the world and the digital world to get together to be able to marshal a better enforcement mechanism? We began to do that. Of course, it's all fallen apart now with the current administration. But the fact is, uh, I remember meeting the Rapa Nui of Easter Island when I was in Chile at the Oceans Conference. And, and they were committed to protecting their waters. Their MPA was officially designated last year. Uh, and then the designation, of course, of the uh, Revilla Hijedo uh, National Park off the Pacific coast of Mexico created the largest MPA, Marine Protected Area, in North America. Last summer, the New Caledonia government took the first steps in the Coral Sea Natural Park. So we can do these things, folks. We're just not doing them fast enough, and we're not doing them with the capacity to guarantee that the commitment is, in fact, real and upheld. I am, uh, two years ago, uh, in Malta, uh, I joined with the Monterey Bay Aquarium in launching the Southeast Asia Fisheries and Aquaculture Initiative. And we're working locally in five countries to listen and learn as they lead the drive to sustainable development. In January, I met in Hanoi with the Vietnamese leaders to encourage collaboration, further collaboration with the private sector and government to advance sustainability of shrimp farming through an all-of-government approach, which is what Ireland is talking about, just like you have uh, here. And we're bringing together technology experts and local markets, finance experts, all of the major industry players who are critical to making this happen. But I don't see the kind of gathering of these players in the way the government ought to be gathering them and guaranteeing that we're coming up with the agreement to move. We've announced a commitment now with the Minfu Seafood, one of the largest shrimp producers in Vietnam, to bring 20,000 shrimp farms in the Mekong Delta up to the highest levels of sustainability by 2025. We need that on a global basis. We're working with the private sector because supply chain companies can send behavior-changing market signals that galvanize action well beyond what any government itself is going to be able to do by itself. So an example of how this can happen and happen with good effect is Indonesia, the second largest fishing nation with 9 million jobs hanging in the balance, a nation of 238 million people who depend on seafood as their primary source of protein. Ten years ago, they were in a collision course with Mother Nature that threatened to drive the industry into bankruptcy and plunder fishing stocks for generations. Instead, led by philanthropic sector, not government, not business, but the philanthropic sector, fishermen and fishing families and their governments created a compact for a new way of doing things, not to stop fishing, but to fish smarter. Uh, it was a compact to fish sustainably and to trust each other uh, and, and to reap the benefits of a network uh, 
of protected areas that no one was allowed to opt out of. Today, instead of too many fishermen chasing too few fish, illegal fishing is going down and the daily catch is going up. There are more fish, there are bigger fish, and policymakers in Jakarta are reassured by new economic data that they can bring to local communities projecting uh, that if their fisheries stay like this, then fishing communities by 2050 could be earning nearly $2.3 billion more. This can be done. So, as someone who represented a fishing state for 28 years in the United States Senate, I dealt firsthand with this. I was also chairman of the fisheries subcommittee, uh, fisheries subcommittee of, the, of a committee of the Commerce Committee for a period of time and worked with Senator Ted Stevens of, of uh, Alaska. And so I got to know all our fisheries really well, the tuna fisheries in California, the salmon fisheries, the crab fisheries, the cod fishery, which we don't have in New England anymore. Uh, and I'll tell you, uh, fishermen and their families are our partners, not the enemy in this. That is clear. Uh, you know, Willie Sutton, who was a famous bank robber, American bank robber, used to say he robbed banks because that's where the money was. Well, we need to work with fishermen because that's where the fish are. And they know the oceans and their estuaries better than anybody, and I think we have to team up more effectively uh, with fishing people. So, folks, what we need to understand is, I remember talking to a fisherman in Massachusetts who, uh, he, he, they, the group of fishermen, they told me, you know, we started fishing when we were six, seven years old with our dad. And, uh, they said, if we hauled up a, a, a net full of juvenile fish, uh, my grandfather would say to me, don't eat your seed corn. Fishermen are born conservationists, most. And if you provide the right oversight and incentives and partnership, I believe we can bring fishermen around the world, fishing people, uh, into this solution. So my friends, uh, It takes a village to meet the ocean challenge. Uh, but let me be crystal clear, it can't be a Potemkin village. And we can't afford to do just a little bit here and a little bit there anymore. We're not gonna make it if that's what happens. There are too much, too many powerful forces pushing against it. I think of the battle we had in America for a long period of time to rid ourselves of the scourge of cancer through smoking. And I think of R.J. Reynolds and the lies that were told corporately for years. Well, we're being told lies today in this world. Uh, there's a major lawsuit today which I have signed on to with many people in an amicus brief. Uh, to hold a uh, major oil company accountable for having hidden information it had from its own scientists about climate change years and years ago. And we obviously don't have the space in time to be lied to by presidents or prime ministers or finance ministers or environment ministers. So in the end, Whether or not we get this done is going to be up to you. You think I'm kidding you, but I'm not. When I say you, it's a generic you. You who have the capacity to vote, particularly. You who live in the luxury of a democracy where you, no one yet arrests you for telling the truth. Where you still have the ability to organize and to go out and make a difference. And I will tell you that is what we have to do today. I had a breakfast meeting with ministers earlier and I said, I'm, I'm back to the militant I was when I came back from Vietnam and opposed the war because it's gonna take militancy to hold the liars and the cheaters and the greedy accountable. There's just no other way that I know of. 
2016, in the United States of America, only 54.2 percent of the eligible voters in that election turned out to vote. When I ran, and, and I, I lost, obviously, but when I ran, it was a 60.3 percent turnout. When Barack Obama was elected in 2008, it was a 63.5 percent. Get the drift. Voting makes a difference. Organizing makes a difference. And what I learned back in 1970 when I was part of the Earth Day movement in the United States of America, and we organized 20 million Americans to come out of their homes on one single day, all of them saying, we want this to be a voting issue and we're going to make a difference, this being not living next to a toxic waste site, not watching the Cuyahoga River light on fire because of oil slick and refuse, not uh, being subject to bad air in New York and Los Angeles where you couldn't see across the city. That's what it was like. But you know what? Those 20 million people translated into a political movement. And they organized. And we targeted the 12 worst votes in the United States Congress. And in the next election, we defeated seven of the 12. With that defeat, all of a sudden, the survivors said, whoops, this is a voting issue. We better pay attention. And we passed the Clean Air Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the Coastal Zone Management Act. We created the Environmental Protection Agency of the United States of America, which we didn't even have until that election took place. So it can be done. I have zero doubt whatsoever that it can be done. And what we need to do now is understand the power that we have to go out and organize and hold people accountable, hold the politicians accountable, make sure they are delivering. In the 1700s, when the world's pioneering map maker Richard Hacklett set out to map the oceans and write the globe's first commercial atlases for navigation. He'd never been to sea. He didn't have the information or the money or the first-hand knowledge. He didn't even know if it could be done. He went to the portside bars of England and he bought sailors rum and he listened to their stories and he went home each night and he tried to connect their stories of far-off geographies and trade routes and put it on paper in the form of maps. He didn't have satellite imaging. We do. He didn't have Google. He didn't have Skype. He didn't have the ability to talk face to face with the fishermen 10,000 miles away without leaving a cubicle, something we can do today. He didn't have billions of dollars in collective resources from research universities and governments and businesses determined to preserve their way of life. But somehow, he did it. And if he could map the oceans with so little information, surely we can save the oceans with the level of innovation, insight, and investment that Hacklett could never dare dream existed. Resolving climate change, my friends, is not a matter of whether we can do it. It's a matter of whether we decide to do it. This is not a question of capacity. This is a question of political will. So I believe that uh, we have to do this, obviously, before the reefs are gone, before the species are wiped out, before the sixth extinction takes hold, more than it is already threatening life and species on this planet. We have the ability to do this. That's what this is about. I know that sometimes it seems futile. Alicia maybe expressed a frustration with that. So I want to just remind you of the words of somebody I admire greatly. I got to work for 29 years, 20, well, more years, I guess, old totally, with Ted Kennedy. Uh, and his brother Bobby, importantly, went to South Africa in the midst of 1968, the year he was assassinated. And he delivered an important message there to those who were fighting apartheid. He said, you know, the greatest of all dangers is futility, the belief that there's nothing that can be done against the enormous array of the world's ills, against poverty or injustice. But then he went on to say that each of us can work to change a small portion of events. And in the total of all those acts, 
Each time a man or woman strikes out and gets to justice or works to change the course of events, he or she sends forth a tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples can build a current that will sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. There's a one person who walked into this hall in Cork to be a prisoner of history. We're here to turn the tide of history. And we are here in time to do the job that we know we have to get done. So let's just get it done. Thank you.